Hello, everybody. Welcome to ENM 2020, and we are now in week 37 of this course. We're wrapping up, but we've decided to have a series of, um, of kind of more informal discussions about particular topics. And one of the topics that was suggested by, by various among the, uh, the participants was that of scale uh, in niche modeling, which is to say uh, the spatial extent over which you do your modeling or you transfer your models and the spatial resolution with which you do that. And these are interesting questions. You know, wouldn't we all love to have a, um, a model come out that is, you know, maybe one meter resolution for the whole world, right? Wouldn't that be cool? Because then you'd know, you know, depending on the species, you'd know where every individual was, or you'd have a, a prediction of where every individual was. And so let's start maybe by just thinking about what are the relevant factors? What do we have to take into consideration? I mean, let's imagine we, we're gonna start working with some species that none of us has ever worked with before. And we, for whatever reason, maybe our boss says, you know, I need a model of this tomorrow morning, right? So first of all, as you've seen in this course, we say, you are not getting it tomorrow morning. We'll talk to you in a month. But beyond that, what should we be thinking about? So I'll throw out some things to begin with. And what it, one is the spatial accuracy and precision available to us in the occurrence data. Okay. And a second one is what is the spatial resolution available to us in the environmental data? So that's certainly one set of considerations because if your occurrence data are precise only to kilometers, then you have no way of going down to meters. If your key environmental data sets are only available down to or up to a particular resolution, you're stuck with that. What, what else should we be thinking about? Go ahead, Jorge. I would be thinking about the scale at which the ecological and biogeographical processes take place. So at certain scales, you see certain processes taking place, for instance, competition for, for food. That takes place at the scale of individuals, uh, say, competing for a particular type of acorn or, or seed or whatever. And that happens at a very, very um, small scale, at a very high resolution. Whereas things like climate properly understood takes place a much larger uh, unit. So the one thing I would like, well, the one thing I always worry about is what processes are governing what I do at what scales. And of course, often you don't have a precise answer, but normally you have an intuition of what, uh, what is the case. And um, I think that in each modeling, this matters a lot because people sometimes forget that uh, well, there are certain processes that are take place at the scale of meters, and those are very difficult to capture in each modeling. Yeah, I think that's a good point. You know, if we take any organism and we look at a spectrum of spatial resolutions from way too fine to way too coarse, we can see that there's, there's kind of a sweet spot in there for that species. Over here at the way too fine, we may have occurrences that are perhaps all within the daily movements of an individual. And so those may be completely irrelevant 
because the individual is just passing kind of randomly through and not really selecting. You know, so square millimeters on the floor of my office um, kind of doesn't matter. I, I, the whole office is, is relevant to my daily movements. But then we come up to some, some meso resolution that is relevant to what I do. You know, right now I'm sitting in this nice sunny window because it's cool this morning. But, but um, by tomorrow morning, by, sorry, by this afternoon, this seat gets way too hot. And so I move over there to the couch. And so there we have environments affecting individual dis, uh, decisions. But then if we wanna go up to a population scale, we're talking about decisions in a, in a meso sense where a population is maintained or not because it's able to replace itself or not. Unless he's asking, why is Jorge here? Okay, okay. I'm, I'm, being well, I'm recording and a, a couple hundred people around the world are seeing you, so. Okay. So uh, at that population scale, we have things that are relevant to determining whether populations can be maintained. And that's kind of where we're talking about for niche modeling. We're not talking about modeling individual movements, although probably these same tools could be adapted to that, those questions. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Um, and then there, if you keep going up to coarser and coarser scales, there's probably resolutions where all of the relevant conditions are so averaged that within a pixel, some very coarse pixel for our species, there are er sub areas that are suitable and sub areas that are not suitable. And so you can, I'm just saying that for any species, there's probably some resolution that is relevant to that species populations and whether they can be maintained and whether they will persist in the long term. And that's that's going to be a question of the natural history of each individual species. Yeah. I'm going to add there, like this is all the biological thinking behind selecting an extent in a resolution. But there's also all this other side, which is related to more the kind of like the GIS part, like the geographic or special thinking that you have to do. And, and that has to do with how good is the data that was used to create those layers? What was the origin of those layers? And of course, knowing a little bit about how those layers are created, it's very important. So you decide whether using a very fine resolution is okay for your question or, or not. So we have now uh, remote sensing data, which can be very fine resolution. And now we have also this uh, climatic or bioclimatic layers, which can be very fine as well, like one kilometer, that's very fine resolution compared to how the data is because the original data to produce those layers, at least like from certain databases like Chelsea Climate or, or WorldClim are uh, meteorological stations or weather stations. And those are scattered around the world. Some places have more, some places don't have any. Uh, and, and then you have to start thinking about how appropriate it is to use certain resolution for certain areas as well. You're muted. In fact, I think it's not unreasonable to say that I don't think I've seen 
any or at least any detailed analysis of the effects of error in the independent environmental data on niche model outcomes. I mean, we've all talked about it. We've all talked about the fact that, you know, going in the world climb coverages between, let's say, you know, India north into Tibet, you go from very high density of weather stations to very low density of, of weather stations. And you're also crossing a major topographic boundary and going into a totally different climate system, and yet there's no data. Um, and we've talked about, you know, in this course about the differences in density that you see across the world in terms of weather stations and weather stations being used in, in generating those surfaces. So how does that interface with niche model accuracy? I don't think I've seen a single detailed, Jorge, do you know of one? I think there is one. Okay, I'm if you, trying to remember the, 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 the authors, but... If you can think of it, send it to me and I'll put it on the, on the course site. Yeah, but, it's, it's, but, you know, given all of the thousands of, oh, well, not thousands, but dozens to hundreds of methods papers that have been generated in this field, 3, people really in general believe that the environmental data are correct. And that is not true, right? The environmental data approximate a truth and they are better approximations in some regions or better approximations at some time. You know, we can say, oh, we'll just use remote sensing data and that way it's not a function of density of weather stations. But the remote sensing data get highest quality when the satellite is directly vertical and lower quality when it's off nadir. They are compromised by cloud cover and things like that. So there is error variation or there's quality variation in the remote sensing data as well. Um, I'm just, you know, at this stage in the course, we've got a bunch of people who are listening to this course who may go out and, and do some really interesting analyses. And I think this is one thing that has not been assessed, at least not been assessed in detail. Yeah. yeah using remote sensing data helps. But as you said, sometimes there's just so much cover of clouds that you cannot use any of those images. Like I was doing some things in the Amazon region in the southern part of Ecuador. And I think from five years, I, could, I had like nine good images or eight good images. That's for the entire season of the, for the entire dry season only. I didn't have any good approximation for the wet season because it's full of clouds. So tropical that's montane, tropical, lowland habitats, but especially tropical humid habitats are particularly difficult. And in the Amazon, you have both cloud cover, but also smoke and haze. Unfortunately, these days, a little too much smoke. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk a little bit about comparing world clean that comes from interpolating climate stations with mera clean that comes from satellite which is supposed to be high resolution and a very um, even coverage of the surface of the planet, more or less. Mm -hmm. Certainly the climate stations are not uh, evenly distributed. Yeah, for my, for my 2014 book, I did some calculations that were kind of interesting, which was to look at the density of climate stations for temperature and precipitation contributing data to different resolution products of world clip. And suffice it to say, it was, it was always above 90% of the pixels whose values were filled by interpolation and not by data. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now that would be maybe, maybe okay if 
those stations were were kind of distributed evenly across the earth. But we know that's not true. Rather, those stations are clumped in certain countries that both have the, the density of climate stations and contribute the data to the global climate data networks. And that makes for even lower levels of data filling and even higher levels of interpolation across much of the earth. So the world clim data, I mean, yeah, that, that paper has been cited, what, 8,000 8, times or something like that. Um, but I wonder if there's a limit to the utility of that product. I'll certainly say that I personally use it for one reason, and that is that the data are well keyed or well uh, cross-linked to uh, future and past GCM data sets. If Chelsea or Mariclim were so cross-linked as WorldClim is, I don't think I'd ever use WorldClim. And when I do analyses that don't involve GCM data in the future and the past, I don't use WorldClim. The variables are different. So in WorldClim, you have precipitation. In Mariclim, you have humidity. Yeah. So that's, that's because Mariclim is, is essentially derived from remote sensing products rather right. than you know, a, a, a precipitation gauge. But that means that if you need rain, 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 Mariclim is not good for you. Yeah, of course, what, what matters to organisms, it may be rain, but probably more often what matters is, is humidity, essentially the availability of moisture. Nope. There are things that require water, like in little pools. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I said certainly in some cases that's true. Um, but in many cases, it's the availability of moisture so that one doesn't desiccate. But yeah, bo both can be true. I'm just saying that if, if you know, like the, the people That's who developed, cool. if people who were developing those uh, data sets were to take the time to cross-link their data to the GCM results, to whatever extent it's possible, then they might see a bit more use. So it's just a just a thought. Now there is a this is kind of a, a bit tangential, but if people check out a paper by um, Ribeiro, R I B E I R O, I'll put it on the site. It's in Biodiversity Informatics a few years ago. Um, Mateus Ribeiro uh, points out that the real resolution in uh, GCM data is kind of exaggerated and, and um, its coarseness is underappreciated because we use a method for downscaling called the delta method. And the delta method basically takes the, the fine resolution of the, um, of the present day data available and infuses that into the future or past data. And many of us believe that that falsely exaggerates the fine resolution of those data. Um, I'll, I'll put that paper on the site, but uh, it's, it's worth considering that uh, that downscaling method may be very deceptive as far as the resolution that we have in our data. That's, that's tangential, but I think it does make a huge difference. And the other thing is the resolution of the occurrence data, the presence data. Yep. In the past was 
um, not really very precise because there were no GPSs. What, and even now I mean? with GPSs, we have, uh, well, a, a minimum resolution, which often is in the order of many hundreds of meters. So um, it's a bit of a um, mirage to try to go to seven decimal points as you sometimes see in some of the georeferences. That's simply not true. Well, one thing that we all blithely do, I, I do it as little as I, as I uh, can manage, but one thing that we all do is download data from a biodiversity data portal and use those data. And we really need to look at the metadata. And there's a crucial field called coordinate uncertainty in meters. And that field tells you essentially, yeah, here is the precise point, the best guess as to the location. But the actual coordinate is going to fall within some circle or some shape around that. And so you should be filtering coordinate uncertainty uh, in meters to remove the points that are too coarse for the resolution of environmental data that you wish to use. Now, those metadata they were developed by a, um, a good friend and colleague, John Wichorek. Those metadata have been added pretty densely to um, vertebrate data in US collections. And that was done as part of the, the VertNet project. Um, outside of the VertNet project, they're almost completely lacking. And so to my view, that is a major, major gap in what we do as far as serving a robust data infrastructure for biodiversity informatics. Um, I've said for years that communities, so it might be the people who work with mollusks, or it might be GBIF, or it might be iDigBio, or whichever community you wish, they should take on as a major significant um, project the idea of adding not just the georeferences, which themselves are often lacking, but the georeferences with full best practices metadata. I'll put up the, the links to that. If those data are not there, there are very few ways to interpret and filter occurrence data appropriately. Pretty much the only thing you could do would be to look at the age of the specimen, because we know when GPS data became available. And we also know when GPS data became about an order of magnitude more precise. I think it was President Clinton that removed that filtering. Um, and then um, we know that there's a, a point somebody somewhere kind of early 20th century where people uh, started adding directions from. So they might say, before that, the specimen is from Lawrence, Kansas. And then somewhere in the early to middle 20th century, it became five miles north, northeast of Lawrence, Kansas. And so that helps. But all of those, all of that information can be interpreted appropriately and metadata provided and developed. And that will make a qualitative difference to how much data we can responsibly use when we are doing niche modeling with data that we find. There is some, I mean, of course, what you're saying is strictly true, but in practical terms, what I do is I never, since uh, in GB, for instance, that field that you mentioned is almost always empty. Uh, what I do is never do a model at, at uh, a resolution higher than one kilometer. And one kilometer is fair enough. I mean, if, if coordinate says one kilometer, probably it's around one kilometer. 
I would strongly disagree, which is to say one kilometer is fine for GPS derived data. So if you were filtering your data to data derived, say after 2000, maybe, maybe most of the time you're okay. But I'll give you examples. Um, there have been some huge um, imaging projects at some major herbaria around the world. And typically the, the herbarium projects do a skeletal data capture and then the image and then the detailed data capture. Well, I'm not going to name names, but one major herbarium captured 6 million images. And the skeletal data capture that was done before that was just country. And some well-meaning soul added a georeference to that text-based geographic information. And so there are country centroids for millions of plants and so, you know, you look at some plant from Libya that is from mesic environments. And so, you know, it's only up there in the Northern Rim along the Mediterranean and the point falls exactly on the centroid of Libya. That's, that's one of one of data cleaning, right? You first go and remove centroids of countries, centroids of, of steep kilometers, atlas cells and stuff like that. Uh, and, and there are data sets that you know have that sort of problem. I, I mean, those I don't use. Uh, so, uh, but if I, if I end with a data set with, uh, without that kind of a problem, well, I think one kilometer kind of works, generally speaking. I, I would I, assert I would that- a model at, at 200 meters of resolution. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. No, I, certainly that. I personally would say that if you're using data that you don't know much about, you shouldn't go beyond about a 10 minute resolution. So Maybe. 17 kilometer resolution. 17 kilometers, yeah. Uh, now maybe I'm being exaggerated, but um, that, that'd be my feeling. You're persnickety. Persnickety. <laughs> I guess. Uh, all of this is relevant in the conversation about extent and resolution because it's it's not only that you have to think about how good is your data, but based on that, you can go ahead and select the type of variables or the resolution of variables that you are going to use. Uh, I don't know who that person is, but I'm going to remove them. Sorry if this is a friend. Okay, go ahead. I don't know who that was, but... Yeah, yeah, better be careful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so that I was saying that depending on how good the quality of your data is, you can also go ahead and, and try to to work with better or, or like finer or coarser resolutions of your variables. That's that's at least uh, an idea. And of course, here is the other the other part of the of the scale problem, the extent. Uh, if your work is in a, in an extent that is like too broad, it doesn't matter. You can go coarser and coarser, and probably. The macroecological pattern is going to be there still. You're going to see something. But if your extent is really like a very, a very small area in the world or in a country, because the species is there and because that's your area of interest, then it, it becomes a little bit more complicated. And of course, when that happens, the good thing is that you're usually are kind of the, the few people working on the species is usually your own data from records or people in your country working with those. And you can go ahead and check the points or records that you have. But but yeah, that's, that's uh, another part of the story about selecting resolution, about the scale in the, in the ecological niche model. One, one thing that you can think about is Imagine that you did have the data on coordinate uncertainty. 
You could create a frequency histogram of number of records versus coordinate uncertainty. And then you could sweep from fine to coarse or from coarse to fine. And you could see how many records do I have if I have, um, if I want to use this, you know, 10 kilometer resolution product. And how many fewer do I have if I want to use one kilometer? And how many fewer do I have if I want to go down to 30 meters? And you're going to be basically gaining the, the resolution and maybe the quality of the environmental data, but losing the numbers of occurrence data. And so you can imagine even developing multiple models, one having more sample size and one having uh, finer resolution. Okay, but that histogram is very crucial because you get to see the effects of, of, de of decisions about, about spatial resolution. Now, one thing we should talk about is the extent of what, what we've called G, you know, the whole spatial extent of interest. Now, you guys know that we, that we, that we um, calibrate our models across M. So we should be calibrating our models across reasonable and, and biologically appropriate extents. But once the model is calibrated, we can, we can, in theory, transfer that model to the whole universe. It doesn't matter because the model has been calibrated across a reasonable, biologically appropriate extent. Now, when we do transfer it to the whole universe, you guys now know about the MOP metric and being able to say transferring it to those regions would be out of range and would be extrapolative. But there's nothing wrong with transferring our model to that region. It's a pity Enrique Martinez is not on, on this um, conference because he's always talked about transferring niche models to other planets to see whether species could persist there. Um, you don't lose anything, but you have to use your uh, metrics of extrapolativeness to make sure you might not be misinterpreting by doing that transfer. Uh, I just wanna, yeah, go on, Marvin. No, I just want to mention something because Tom talked about how many records you maintain when you are reducing resolutions. I think uh, I just want to clarify that he was talking about if you decrease, uh, increase the resolution of your variables, and if your uncertainty is a defined value at some like 10 kilometer or five kilometer distance. Uh, then if you go below, like if you go to find the resolutions and that you're going to lose those records. That's what he was talking about. Yeah, thank you. And it can happen the other way around as well. If you have, let's say 50 points in thought, if you are working with one kilometer variables resolution, and then you go to 10 kilometer, then five of those points can be in the same pixel and that's gonna be just one record. You can also lose records the other way around. Yeah. So, but this is gonna be because of another reason, because you don't wanna have replicated or uh, duplicated values in your uh, records with which you are gonna calibrate your models. So it's, Thank you it's for just, the clarification, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jorge, you had something on your mind. Yes, um, this issue of the G versus the M, uh, M matters for certain algorithms, but not for others. So um, I, um, for instance, Maxent is sensitive to the background. And, and if you change the area that you are using to do the calibration, you're bound to change 
the results of your or your model. But not not all algorithms have the same problem. To me, M mostly is very important for the extrapolation part. <clears throat> but this is something in which we still have an argument and uh, we are still like uh, trying to find out um, um, a good answer to the question of whether G matters or not. Uh, I tend to think that it, uh, M, M depends or not, it, it, it matters or not. And I tend to think that it depends on the algorithm. It's not a generic problem. That's my, but I am not entirely certain. So I would be quite open to being uh, contradicted and criticized on this. <clears throat> I think it's true. It matters for some algorithms, especially the ones that use background yeah. data, or let's call it pseudo absence data as well. Like, not they are not the same, but pseudo absences also behave kind of background. Yes. Uh, and I guess they also like they should matter when you're using absence data as well, because you, that's the area in which your absences matter as well. Uh, and so those three cases: the background, pseudo absence, and absences. The M should matter. Yes, because you're you're having something to compare with your occurrences need to be compared with the when, and, when you are using any of those methods. Part of your model is your M specification. You cannot ignore it, and and doing it on political geopolitical grounds is a big mistake. And we have seen it happening many times, and we have even. Uh, contributed to this discussion in, 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 in papers mm -hmm. where people draw a line, well, this is west of the Urals and east of the Urals and that's it. Well, I mean, that's a big difference. Down, you're muted. Muted. Except when the sampling is limited geopolitically. So you may have a species with a very large M, but it's only been sampled in the state of Illinois. And so you may want to calibrate in the sampled subset of M. But then you are very careful at transferring. Exactly. That's, that's very important. Even if you have kind of a good idea of a biological like meaningful M, and if you know the species and all that, if you know that there is no sampling, or at least the sampling has been so scarce in some areas, you may want to clip those areas based on administrative borders that matter in terms of sampling, like countries or sometimes states, <clears throat> sometimes like some provinces in some countries because they have kind of different, they manage different differently certain things about monitoring biodiversity. I think one thing that's useful about these discussions kind of as, as an additional lesson in this in this ENM 2020 course is for the participants to see that some of these things don't have a final answer yet. There is not a best method. And really, if you look at any set of tools, that's the case. You know, if I give the same multivariate statistical problem to 20 expert statisticians, they're not going to do that analysis exactly the same way. But probably those methods are quite a bit more consistent and, and um, cohesive than the niche modeling methods are at this point in the development. And so I think it's, it's worth pointing out that that our methodology, our as a field, is still pretty diverse. And some labs, even some very active publishing labs, leading labs, would do things very differently than, you know, the, in this case, you know, Jorge and me and, and, and our students, you know, what we do here at KU. Um, and that doesn't mean that one is right and one is wrong or that everybody is right. But there are some pretty strong opinions. I think Jorge said last week that our group 
tends to do analyses that emphasize getting the conceptual framework in place and letting that guide us. And other labs tend to emphasize more sophisticated statistical frameworks. And, you know, some of the most interesting interactions I've had in the last several decades have been getting together with people from other labs and debating, you know, and ideally it's done kind of fun. And ideally there might be a beer sitting there and, you know, in front of each person, but, but it's not always, you know, friendly and fun. Ideally it is. I'm just wanting to point out that these methodologies are not set in stone. They are not final. There is no best protocol. And probably the best protocol is to experiment pretty broadly. And you know, even if you're going to publish this amount of analysis when you write your paper, you may end up doing this amount of experimentation. And that way, you know, somebody asks you the question, you know, well, what what, is, what effect does M have on your results? And you're able to say, well, if I used a much smaller M, I get this. And if I used a much larger M, I get that. Or, you know, if I use a, a even probability background versus a, a, an uneven probability background, I get these differences. You know, so I'm just pointing out that these methods are not final. And these methods are still evolving. My own strong belief is get the concepts right first. And then a lot of the other variables will matter less if you have the concepts right. My feeling, my opinion. And besides, like good or a strong statistical. Uh, methods, if you want to call them like that, don't have, they don't have to be divorced from having the concepts right. Like, in fact, when you have both right, it's very, it's a lot easier to publish something and it's a lot easier to explain something and to answer questions or even to reject a change that is suggested by reviewers because you already know what will happen and, and you already have an answer justifying your decision that's the best way to do things because you don't have a final methodology prepared for anything in the field like other than certain analysis there's nothing said already i'm going to do some presentations again by request of the students but after we finish these discussion sections i'm going to do some presentations on publishing your results and one of the most important elements of that is, you know, you send your paper in, the editor sends it out to review, the reviewers come back and make all these comments and sends it, and the editor sends it back to you. And then what you have to do is revise your manuscript, but also respond to the reviewers. And that response document is really crucial. It basically makes it or breaks it about does the editor just reject it? Does the editor send it back out for more review? Or ideally, does the editor say, eh, looks like they did a good job with this revision, accept. And in that response to reviewers document, what Marlon said just now becomes really important because many times a reviewer will say, well, I'm, I'm quite worried about you know, this assumption that these people made. And I know they cited a paper about this, but I think that that thing really makes a difference and that they've screwed up. And so you then say back to the editor, well, look, we took that assumption and we changed it this way and we changed it this way. And here are the results. Guess what? They're the same. And you basically say to the reviewer and to the editor, you see, I told you it doesn't matter. It's really important. Yeah, you generally don't say I told you, but <laughs> uh, 
it's it's a way to say that you did the things so you are oh, like sure about your results at least you are confident in that you are not lying or your assumptions are not too bad for or not bad for your for answering your specific questions um, I, I yeah dealing with the editors and reviewers is an art there is there is one thing that I wanted to mention about DM and other algorithms. Tom, you're muted again. Okay. <laughs> uh, and it was that Jorge said for some algorithms it doesn't matter. But I don't. Uh, I think yes, it doesn't matter for running the algorithm. But I think M is a crucial thing to think about because imagine you're doing ellipsoids the simple ellipsoids that do not require you to have a, a, a restricted area where to calibrate the model. And then you calibrate the ellipsoid or you explore your data. If you explore your data in the complete nice. scenario of the world, the environmental space, it's gonna be your records in one place and very, like it's gonna be uh, not so rare, but it's gonna be more difficult to have it in a scenario that matters. Well, if you have an M and you clip the raster layers to an M, you're gonna compare your records in a background, in a scenario that matters for the species or for you're thinking about how the extrapolation, the few extrapolation that an ellipsoid can do, it's gonna affect or it's gonna behave in your model. I think it's it's an important concept to have, and it's an important uh, area to have, just to explore data, even even in also to do interpretations about your models, even if your algorithm don't don't use sure. it. I, I agree, and let me see if I can rephrase some of what I understood from your words. Uh, this is the work that Laura, my PhD student, is doing. Uh, you can use an ellipsoid that does care, doesn't care about the background in some theoretical sense, it just the points, the occurrences that are used to fit the ellipsoid. But if you are in the periphery, because you're in, you're in the periphery of our forbidden zones to get data, first data, and that is going to sample, to, to bias your understanding of things. Whereas if you're in the middle of a cloud of points because your M is in the middle of an environmental space, then you have points all around and, 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 and it's very informative to, to, have, to know that your occurrences only occur in a particular region. It's not because it is impossible to get other points as if it would be if you were in the periphery of the environmental space. So yes, absolutely, Marlon, you are right. Uh, even if the method is not depending on the um, uh, M on the background. It may well be the case that your understanding of the problem depends crucially on M. It takes us back to Hutchinson's world versus Wallace's world. And Wallace's world is one of those ones where, okay, you know, you, you, your M basically is constraining the, the dimensions of that ellipsoid or that box in a bioclim analysis. And you have no way around that. Okay. Um, any other comments, any last thoughts? Okay. Well, thank you guys very much for your time. And um, we'll be back next week. See you. Bye, guys. Bye, folks. <laughs>